All right, moving on to specimen. So here's where you put in your sample material, your sample shape, and also the dimensions of your sample. So for material type, you can switch between plastic, metal, and rubber. And essentially what this affects is it affects the data processing parameters which are found in your second tab, or your subsequent tab, rather. Um, so this shows a stress-strain curve that's more typical of a plastic sample. If we were to move to metal, it's going to show a stress-strain curve typical of a metal sample. And some of the uh, data processing parameters are also specific to that material type as well. In addition to the material type, you can do your sample shape. So plate, which is showing a typical dog bone right now. Rod, uh, a circular cross section. Also tubes, you can define your tube uh, dimensions as an inner diameter or an outer diameter. You can also do outer diameter and wall thickness. You can also compress rings as well, or uh, pension rings as well. And then some also kind of more eccentric things, so yarn, uh, if you're doing um, fiber testing. Um, this does units of gauge length and also linear density. Um, that's another way of measuring your... Uh, <laughs> There you go. So this is a nice little dog bone sample and it actually already has one of the sets of markers already affixed to it. Uh, that goes. And lastly, uh, this might come in uh, handy when you're compression testing. If it's kind of an odd shaped sample that has non-traditional non cross sections uh, that aren't defined in here already, uh, you can choose this area. Um, so you can calculate your stress on the sample uh, based off just a cross sectional area that you can input. Also in here you put um, the quantity of samples you want to run per batch and also the amount of batches you want to run per, um, per sample. So let's just say you have um, two different sample sets you want to run and you have three of each. So let's say quantity per batch three and we have two, um, two batches. So that'll kind of populate uh, the type of samples that we have here. Uh, we can name the samples different things. Uh, they're auto named by their batch and sample number, and you can also uh, enter in the dimensions of the samples in this area too. Uh, you can enter them in later on, as I'll show you, but uh, if you kind of know the sample dimensions ahead of time, you can enter them in here. All right. Data processing. <coughs> so here's where you actually pick the data points that you're pulling off the test um, as you're testing it. You can spend a lot of time in here. Uh, similar to how you can pull up the help feature specific to the window that you're in, uh, handy here is where you can pull up the help feature specific to the data processing parameter that you're in. So just for, uh, for easy to say, let's take um, break. So we'll click break. And right now it's selected a break force, but we can select any, da any data processing parameter at that break point. So we can get break stress, break stroke, the displacement of break, you know, things of that nature. And to select those, we just need to ch uh, check these little check boxes. Uh, so when in this window at any time, like I said, you can click the help, and it will take you to the um, help menu for that certain data processing parameter. And uh, this is handy, I feel, because you know, in material science, there is different nomenclature um, for different values you're trying to get. And it also tells you how the computer itself calculates these certain values, because how you would look at the graph and kind of calculate yourself, and how the computer calculates it, it might be slightly different. Um, so for instance, it goes into your, uh, the way to text the break, like we were talking about, the drop in that 10% from full scale, um, and so on and so forth. So other interesting things that are common to pick from here, uh, you can select your elastic modulus, you can detect your yield point, some other features include point picking. Uh, so if you have certain features along your graph that you kind of want to mark and then do data processing from there, you can point pick, so for uh, post data analysis. Um, like I said, there's a lot of things and a lot of variability that you can happen or that you can um, configure in this screen. Uh, this is where it gets kind of specific to your type of testing. Uh, for standard dog bones, you know, like I said, you know, break force, break stress is really important. Um, your max force is, is very important if you have a sample that has a tendency to neck as opposed to just breaking discreetly. Um, so you can select your uh, various data processing points at your max value. <coughs> Again, like I was saying earlier, getting your elastic modulus.
in addition to your data processing parameters for this screen, you can select your uh, statistical analysis for each of those data processing parameters. So this includes your average, standard deviation, uh, maximum and minimum within that test batch. Uh, you can also get to some more eccentric things like your Six Sigma values um, as well. Similar to the sensor screen where you can define certain sensors, you can also define certain data processing points. And kind of the difference, difference between defining a sensor and defining a data processing point is that one with a sensor, it's only calculated based off of the sensors that you have chosen so far, whereas you can um, define a certain formula based off of any of the previous data processing parameters that you've selected so far. Like I said, it looks the same, takes up a little calculator. You write the formulas very similarly to how you would write an Excel formula using asterisks for multiplications, uh, forward slashes for divisions, uh, using your uh, brackets and parentheses appropriately. Um, you can select a unit for your data processing or you can write in a unit of your own. Um, name the formula itself if you want to. Um, this comes in uh, handy frequently when you're using kind of eccentric jigs, uh, either cantilever bending jigs, like I was saying earlier, torsion jigs. Um, another difference between the data processing uh, custom formulas and the sensor custom formulas is that this is all done after the test is run. It's more of a post-analysis as opposed to something that's constantly calculated uh, in the sensor tab. All right. So going to the chart, I'm almost done. Um, so this essentially defines how the chart displays as your test is running. Um, you can have up to four charts. Uh, you can define your x, y axes based off of any channel, any uh, sensor channel that you've either defined or come uh, standard with it so far. Uh, you can have multiple axes. You can have you know, a y prime, x prime, and also a secondary y and x axes. Uh, you can overlay the data if you want. Going down to the setting tab, this is kind of a more um, mundane. Uh, changing the color of your plot lines, um, the uh, spaces of the markations in between the X and Y axis. Lastly, you can set up a pass-fail area. This is more common in QC, where um, essentially it creates a color on your graph, um, so it's a quick check whether your sample has uh, passed or failed a predefined criteria. Lastly, something that I like to do um, is I like to set uh, uh, set the maximum of the graphs at a very low value. So I'm setting it at one newton and one millimeter, and then I have auto scale turned on. So that's in that way when you're starting the test, you can actually see the data uh, propagate across the screen, as opposed to looking at this very large, especially if you're going to a 300 kilometer capacity looking at a very large graph and having a very small amount of data kind of you know, work its way across the screen. Um, lastly, uh, we'll go to the reporting function. So like I said, you can export the data if you want, but frequently uh, you want to create reports within the software. Um, you have your title, which you can change, you know, the sample name. Uh, you also have your legend, which if you double click, uh, there's many things that you can select to be on there, such as the test file, um, the operator name if you set up different passwords, um, report date, test date, you know, things like that. Below that are all the data processing parameters that you put in, and below that is your chart. Uh, like I said, you can have your single chart on there, you can have four charts, you can put four charts on there. Uh, lastly, you can also put an image on here too. Uh, you can put, you know, school, school letter in. So at this point, we've written our method um, that we have an actual sample. We might run a sample. So in this case, I think for the testing screen, I'm going to put more realistic values in here. From here we can either save a method, go on to write another method, go do something else. But what we want to do is we want to test for this method. And ideally, what you do is you write one of these methods 
for kind of each of the uh, test configurations. So you write a basic tensile method, you write a basic compressive method, you write a basic three-point bed method, and then from there, uh, you can modify those methods based off of your sample shape, uh, based off of the material type, your testing speed, so you don't have to go through that whole rigmarole each and every time you want to write a new method. And then from there, once you have those methods written for each of your sample, um, it's very simple. You kind of just select the method, load your sample, and test. So this has kind of been kind of arduous and kind of boring going through the whole method um, development process, but you don't have to do it each and every time you want to run the test, obviously. So right here, here's our testing screen. Um, so going from top to bottom, you have some test controls up here, start and stop, and save, preview the test uh, information. Here are your sensor outputs right here. Um, like I was saying, you can decalibrate from the um, touch panel right there, or you can do it right here. Right click, calibration, go perform the decalibration process. about 30 seconds, and essentially it's, like I said, writing the uh, extensometer data to the frame itself. <coughs> also from here, we can zero our stroke. All right, what else are we going from here? Something else to note about this menu is that there's a few different ways to do just one thing, which is kind of confusing, but the reason why they set it up that way is for different workflows. So for instance, you have a start button right here, you also have a start button right here, uh, you could start it in the frame as well. You can start it from here as well. Um, so like I was saying, when you're writing the method, you can write in your specimen sizes. Rarely when you're writing your method, you know your exact specimen sizes. So specimen size right here, you can bring it up. Add all your specimen sizes as you're micing it up before you run the actual test itself. Uh, you can also change some of the report parameters that you want from the uh, from the buttons on the uh, left. Lastly, something to kind of note is that, going back to what I've been kind of repeating, is that the only thing that's kind of taken from this frame is the uh, force and the displacement. Everything else is a calculation. We have a reanalyze function. So just say you ran a test, you forgot to put a certain data processing parameter on there. You can go back using the reanalyze re function add that data processing parameter in there, uh, finish that method, and then it will apply that data processing parameter to test data that you've already written. So that applies to a test you may have just ran, or a test that you ran months and months ago that you still have the data for. Just load it up in here, uh, do a reanalysis re function, and uh, get whatever data processing parameter that, uh, that you want. So we have our test parameters loaded, we have our data processing points selected. Um, this is kind of unscientific, but just to kind of complete the workflow of uh, writing a method and running a test, we're going to run this little plastic dog bone right here. I don't really know what material this is, I don't know what an ideal test condition this is, so we're, we're both going to see what um, how it is. So to open and close the grips, it's labeled on here, but essentially you kind of rotate these little bars um, on either side to open and close the grips. We might not get it with this sample type because of the length of the uh, non-narrowed section of the dog bone, but a good rule of thumb is that you want 80% um, of your grip face to be covered by sample. And essentially the reasoning behind that is that as these wedges kind of come together as your test is running, it's transmitting force from the grip face itself to the grip body itself. And if you only have a little bit of sample in there, it's only transmitting that force to this little bit of grip body right here. So you want, you know, like I said, 80% is a good rule of thumb. There's a little marker on the uh, grip face itself kind of showing that point as well. There's also little marks on the grip face tops to allow you to kind of center the sample. Sample. 